Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, I know we just did some alternate history a few days ago. We're diving back into that well though because this video came out a week ago and I've been getting a lot of requests uh, for us to take a look at what if Alexander Hamilton was president. You may not know this, but back when this channel was brand new and had only a couple hundred subscribers, I believe the very first live stream I ever did on vlogging through history like I said, a couple hundred subscribers, was about a two-hour live stream where I broke down the musical Hamilton, went song by song, and talked about what the song talks about, but then talked about the real history, what it gets right, what it didn't talk about, what it maybe got wrong. Uh, and I'll put a link down in the description as well as up on the end screen so you can check that out. I re-uploaded that uh, in May of 2021 with a couple of notes that I added to it for some context. Uh, so it was originally live streamed in December of 2020, back when this channel just started. So that'll give you a lot more history behind what really happened in Alexander Hamilton's life, his upbringing, his history, uh, everything that's covered by the musical. But today we're going to dive into this one. I'll put a link down in the description to Alternate History Hub and his original content. Uh, definitely worth checking out everything he has to offer. Let's go ahead and dive into this one. Alexander Hamilton, the man, the legend, the, uh, musical, the founding father who managed to be one of the most underrated and also overrated historical figures at the same time. It's easy to forget. So how is it possible he can be both? Well, for most, I think, of the last 150 years or so, he's been kind of the forgotten founding father. Uh, but then you could argue that because of the success of the musical over the last 10 years that he maybe is a little bit overrated and that probably at some point in the not too distant future, he'll settle back into a more proper place in history. I would highly recommend if you have any interest in biographies, uh, Ron Chernow's bi biography on Alexander Hamilton, which inspired the musical is phenomenal as are all of Chernow's biographies his biography of Grant is one of my all-time favorites uh, really does a great job of giving you all of the context into what is really one of the most fascinating figures in American history how much this man achieved despite the fact that he had enormous hurdles placed in front of yeah. him by both members of the opposition and his own party probably on account of the fact that he was a massive jerk but anyway let's go over his I'm not entirely sure I agree he was a massive jerk. I, I, I don't think he was any more of a jerk than anybody else. I think Thomas Jefferson was a massive jerk. Um, but I don't know. I guess we'll get into it more. Accolades before we add even more. Wrote the majority of the Federalist Papers. Yep. Established the U.S. financial system as first Treasury Secretary by creating the... <laughs> the, the sunglasses are slowly descending onto his face. First bank and first mint. Implemented a complicated plan to pay off state debts, which threatened the very existence of America. Advocated for the cre I feel like there's a little bias leaking into this one already. And, and granted, I'm I'm a pro Hamilton guy for the most part. No, he's not perfect by any means. There's a lot of things to criticize about how Hamilton did things, but to to say that his debt assumption plan threatened to undo America, uh, it was just a very particular view of America, and I'm sure we're going to get into that more, so I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Creation of West Point Academy. Establish the Coast Guard. Wait, did he say that he was a part of establishing West Point? Because that happened... I really don't feel like Hamilton was involved in that. Since of America. Advocated for the creation of West Point advocated Academy. For, okay. Estab he did advocate for the creation of a military academy that was done by Jefferson, who was his political rival. Which the Coast Guard, and became so controversial that many traced the two-party system to the wedge he drew between himself and James Madison. So thanks for that. In a sense, That's freedom, fair. taxes, banking, centralized government, standing army, and political scandals can all be kind of traced back to this guy. Hamilton doesn't just embody the American dream. He built a large part of the framework of America in its most fragile and important days. Not to mention, he did all of that without ever being president. Yep. Which, side note, it's kind of funny this man played a bigger role on both domestic and foreign affairs than John Adams ever did, despite not even being in his cabinet. Just That's true, and here's the thing about John Adams, though. John Adams, the least stellar part of his career was his presidency 
he did a lot for this country before he was president. His presidency was largely a a dark stain on his on his otherwise stellar career as a founding father. Uh, and yeah, these guys were on the same side of the political aisle as it then existed, but absolutely hated each other. All right, so let's get to the point of our divergence. How does a bastard, orphan, son of a whore, and a Scotsman dropped in the middle of the... Okay, that's enough of that. Of a forgotten spot in the Caribbean by Providence impoverished and squalor grow up to he be a hero and a scholar. Yes, I know every word of the musical. It's fantastic. You Credence got your musical reference. I hope you're happy. The first thing that always gets brought up is the constitutional requirements regarding age and citizenship. Not an issue. No change needed there because nope. he actually qualified on both accounts. What really trashed Hamilton's... In so, yeah, the, the, the issue that people seem to not grasp when it comes to Hamilton is that they they think falsely that because Hamilton wasn't born in the United States, he was born uh, on the island of Nevis uh, in the Caribbean, that he doesn't qualify. Uh, but the fact is that nobody at that time, the first seven presidents, were born in the United States because the United States didn't exist yet. Anybody who was already living in the United States when the Constitution was adopted was grandfathered in as a natural born citizen and that included alexander hamilton who was a signer of the constitution uh, he was one of the delegates to the constitutional convention and one of the advocates for a very strong central government he's advocating for things like uh, hereditary uh, lordships for the senate he basically wanted a british style parliament where you had a house of commons that was elected like our house of representatives but that the senate would be more like the house of lords where it was hereditary or that it was for life when you got elected to it uh he also probably would have been okay with the president having much more power than he did ambitions was the reynolds pamphlet a detailed account of his adultery that he wrote himself Thinking it was a brilliant idea. Yeah, that was what ended up tanking his political career. Yep. If we erase that from existence, then he could probably run in the election of 1800. Absolutely right. Uh, I don't know if he would have run in 1800, but he might have run in 1804 uh, if he had lived long enough to run in 1804. Um yeah, so I obviously go into all of this in the in the stream that I did. So if you want all the details of all this stuff, read it or watch that video. But uh, basically, back when he was Secretary of the Treasury under George Washington, back in the early 1790s, uh, this woman, her name was Maria Reynolds. I know it says Mariah Reynolds in the musical, but it was Maria. Maria Reynolds comes to him. She's the wife of this guy, James Reynolds. And his, his family is up in upstate New York, uh, uh, up in like around Albany. Um, with his father-in-law, with his wife's family. And, and so she comes to him at his office and asks for help. Uh, and then he says, you know, come back later and, and I'll get you some money from my house. And, and he makes the mistake of being alone with this woman in his house and she puts the moves on him and they sleep together. And, uh, and then this goes on for a while until uh, her husband writes him a letter to extort him and says, I know what you did. And her husband was a, a piece of work. James Reynolds, this guy was involved in every scam in the book. He was always looking for a way out and looking for money. And there's an argument to be made that maybe he masterminded this thing and got her in on it. But uh, uh, eventually he goes to extort Hamilton and Hamilton pays him off. And this goes on for a while before finally Hamilton says, forget it, I'm not paying you anymore. And Reynolds ends up in prison for some other scams that he's a part of. And he mentions it to some other guy who then leaks it. And so er, while Hamilton's Secretary of the Treasury, this kind of comes out, but it goes nowhere. And that could have been the end of it. But years later, after Hamilton's back in kind of private practice as a lawyer, and he's not even in the government anymore, these guys come to him. And it's not the guys mentioned in the musical. I think it's Muhlenberg, uh, James Monroe, and somebody else. And James Monroe is actually the guy who ends up leaking it. And they almost fight a duel, uh, Hamilton and Monroe do. And it's actually Aaron Burr who gets them to, to settle things without taking it all the way to a duel. But then it, it starts to leak. 
and it probably would have died and gone nowhere, but Hamilton was so concerned that people were going to think that he had embezzled government money or he'd somehow misappropriated funds or done something wrong when he had been Secretary of the Treasury that he writes this like 100-page pamphlet detailing everything that happened. He shows it to some of his friends who say, do not publish this. This will die on its own. You don't need to do this. But this was a flaw in Hamilton's character that he absolutely, he was so committed to his principles that he was blinded by it sometimes. And he couldn't see that it was actually damaging his own career and hurting his family in the process. Against Adams and Jefferson. Wait, that can't be right. Adams and Jefferson were already on the ballot in 1796, a year before the pamphlet leaked. I mean, Hamilton surely would have the ego and confidence to think he could beat both of them, right? Why didn't he run? Hell, he even backed another Federalist candidate to undermine and replace Adams. Yeah. Why didn't he just run? Hell, he didn't even need to try to become governor. How do I make this video? Do I just fundamentally change Hamilton's character? Do I make him do something he simply refused to do in our timeline? Oh my god. He didn't refuse, it just wasn't his time yet. He was a lot younger. I mean, remember, he's still in his 40s. He's got plenty of time. Uh, 1797 was not his time. 1800, 1804, even 1808 maybe, if he had lived. So hear me out. In the 1796 election, right after Washington stepped down, the two major parties were the Federalists and Democratic Republicans. Both put forward several candidates and each electoral member had two votes. Tensions were high, and rhetoric was weaponized against every major candidate. John Adams was called a monarchist, Jefferson a coward and atheist, but neither of them actively campaigned for the presidency. Later on, John Adams would be called a hermaphrodite. <laughs> Here's the thing, and I, I mentioned this in the video as well. One of the reasons I really don't like Jefferson is that while Jefferson was Secretary of State, and him and, and Hamilton had beef with each other. Uh, they were the two most influential members of the cabinet. Hamilton was certainly the most influential member of Washington's cabinet. Um, but uh, Thomas Jefferson actually hires a guy to work for the State Department. Technically, he's on the payroll as a translator, but he's not a translator. He's actually paid to run an anti-government newspaper. So the guy's got a guy on the government payroll to undermine the government. In the midst of all of this, Hamilton, who had fostered a powerful coalition in every sector of American yeah. society, decided to hatch a little scheme. In his eyes, Adams was too ambitious, too scandalous. So while he urged his party members in the North to stick with the plan of voting for Adams and Pinckney, he coordinated his efforts with the South Carolina Senate in an attempt to sway Southern voters to pick Jefferson and Pinckney. This new yeah, and Pinckney is from South Carolina. Nearly resulted in Thomas Pinckney being elected as the second president. That was, if not for the dastardly Federalists who found out and in mass refused to vote for him. The result was a near win for Adams, who became second president. But the fact is that Hamilton almost got his very own Southern puppet into government. This scheme alienated him from Adams, and alongside a scandal, ruined his political career. But and yet, while Adams is president, they decide to create, for the first time, uh, at least somewhat of a standing army. Uh, and everybody knows that the only way that anybody will stand for an army being formed is if George Washington, who has just finally retired, is given the, the role of commander of this army. Well, Washington wants no part of that. He wants to retire. He wants to go home. He wants to finally be left alone. Uh, and so he accepts on the condition that Alexander Hamilton be made his second in command, which everybody knew meant Hamilton would really be the one commanding the army. Uh, and it ends up happening. Actually, Hamilton ends up the commander in chief of the, uh, not the commander in chief, which is the president, the, the highest ranking officer in the army. Uh, which did not sit well with Adams, but he had no choice. What if that plot was never discovered? Hell, let's make it a little more interesting. Let's get rid of John Adams entirely. In 1788, he was returning from Europe. 
Numerous ships often made their way to the bottom of the Atlantic. Why not have a random storm take out a founding father for the fun of it? You know, mm. hypothetically. Now remember, even with Adams gone, this wouldn't mean Hamilton would be president. All signs show that he much preferred to be pulling the strings on behalf of someone else, and there is no finer candidate than Thomas Pinckney, a man who would easily beat Jefferson and become the second US president in this timeline. But who is this guy? A southern Oxford educated lawyer, Patreon, uh, I, I mean Patriot, who was a captain in the Revolutionary War, assisting General Horatio Gates, who later became governor of South Carolina. George Washington assigned him as ambassador to Britain in 92, but he failed to reach an agreement on many terms, so he was replaced by John Jay. He later was sent to Spain, but in all honesty... And John Jay is another forgotten founding father. He's from New York, which New York and Virginia and Pennsylvania, those three kind of center of the country states, are by far, far the most powerful and most influential at this time. This guy just wanted to chill on his rice plantation. He was often on sick leave, and he was chosen as candidate by Hamilton precisely because of how easy he would be to control. Maybe he could oversee the construction of the new capital, while Alexander Hamilton called all the shots and he wouldn't throw any of them away. And interestingly enough, the reason that the capital ends up being where it is, where Washington DC ends up being, uh, along the banks of the, of the Potomac, goes back to Alexander Hamilton's debt assumption plan. He needed the votes in Congress to be able to pass that plan. And basically what it was, was that the, the federal government would assume the debts of all the individual states that had been incurred during the Revolutionary War. By doing that, it helps the federal government create credit for itself because it's owed money by the states, which means in turn that it can borrow money from other places. And It's complicated. I'm not a financial expert by any means, but it also meant centralizing power more with the federal government, which was kind of the point in Hamilton's mind, in addition to helping financially. Of course, the Democratic Republicans are opposed to this. They don't want strong central government. Uh, so they negotiate having the capital further to the south, closer to Virginia, and actually close to George Washington's home at Mount Vernon, in exchange for giving him the votes to pass the debt assumption plan. Now let's turn our attention to revolutionary France. Hmm. But first, quick recap. America declares independence in 1776. France bankrupts itself trying to support it, which leads to a revolution in 1789. In 1793, a... And Jefferson was there when the revolution really gets started. Helps uh, Marquis de Lafayette draft a declaration of the rights of man. Then he comes back to find out that he has not only already been nominated as... Secretary of State, but that the Senate has already approved him as Secretary of State. And so as soon as he arrives home, he's immediately got to go to New York City where he's going to become Secretary of State. Parisian mob guillotines King Louis. A few months later, Ambassador Genet negotiates with Washington in an attempt to make America honor its treaty and go to war with Britain. Genet is so brazenly arrogant that his behavior leads to one of the few times Jefferson and Hamilton agreed on yep. anything, which was to have him replaced. The and Jefferson was very pro-France, pro and Hamilton was seen as pro-Britain in all of this, and so even on foreign policy, they find themselves, for the most part, on opposite sides. Uh, Ham or Jefferson wants Washington to honor its alliance with France, but the argument, of course, is, well, that alliance was made with King Louis the Sixteenth, who is no longer in power, and so uh, we're staying neutral, and Washington keeps us neutral, and, and Adams also manages to keep things neutral, even though we enter into what's called the quasi-war with, with France, where we nearly end up going to war. The Genet Affair arguably led to Jefferson's resignation, paving yep. the way for the Jay Treaty after John Jay did what Thomas Pinckney failed to do in 1794. The treaty settled disputes with Britain which persisted since the end of the war. A huge sum was paid for the damage Britain caused to American shipping, while American debts to British merchants were settled. British troops withdrew from several key forts in the Northwestern Territories, but above all, the two nations would now trade on favorable terms. Britain was America's biggest trading partner, but in order to secure this deal, the issue of freed American slaves and notably the practice of impressment of American sailors by the British Navy... Were Which is an issue that's going to be one of the main points that leads to the War of 1812, impressment, where the British would stop American ships, 
suspected of having uh, guys who had escaped from the British Navy serving on American ships and then take them back and put them basically almost like kidnap them into service on British ships, claiming that they had been on British ships in the first place. We're left untouched, the latter of which would culminate in the War of 1812. This treaty and Washington's response to Genet directly led to the quasi-war with France, at the time known as the Undeclared War. John Adams did everything he could to prevent it from escalating into a real war, and even got Washington out of retirement to prepare an army. Yep. It was Alexander Hamilton who took charge and drilled a young nation against a potential French invasion. But with him in power, things would go sideways real quick. That's actually a fair point. I think you remove John Adams and you don't have Thomas Jefferson, if neither one of those two are president, I think the likelihood of a war with France is escalated. And then, what happens with Napoleon? During the first year of his presidency, the United States State Secretary Hamilton and his loyal cabinet would centralize the nation. And this actually makes a lot of sense to see Hamilton as Secretary of State. Secretary of State was seen as the natural jumping off point to the presidency. Today, we would say vice president. I mean, look, you've got, look how often vice presidents become the nominees of their party or get elected president. Kamala Harris is the vice president. Joe Biden was vice president. Uh, George H.W. Bush was vice president. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty common theme uh, by which people get elected, but back then it was secretary of state. While the powerless vice president Jefferson watched in horror. A stacked Senate with over 65% Federalist majority would introduce taxes and tariffs, and a small standing army would be created. But history, even alternate history, does not function in a bubble. These events wouldn't have any effect on the old world, which was buzzing with activity on account of the actions of Napoleon Bonaparte, who was climbing to the top with his captivating Italian campaign. Against all odds, France had prevailed against the First Coalition, and its self-confidence was at an all-time high. Yeah. All of which leads us to the XYZ affair. Yeah, I mean, so if France is able to take on the likes of Austria uh, and uh, the Italian uh, states, they're not worried about this young upstart country, the United States, that only exists because France helped them in the first place. The bombshell that takes this scenario to a whole other level. So we have a salty French revolutionary government struggling to fund its military campaigns, which had allowed French captains to seize over 300 American merchant vessels. In response, three envoys are sent, Elbridge Jerry, John Marshall, and Charles Pinckney. So uh, Elbridge Jerry, the guy for whom gerrymandering is uh, named, he was vice president. Uh, Thomas Marshall, of course, uh, very well known as uh, the super influential member of the Supreme Court. The president's own brother. Upon their arrival to France, they were denied a meeting with Foreign Minister Talleyrand. Instead, they met with several dignitaries whose identity was kept a secret from the American government by Adam. Did I say Thomas Marshall? I meant John Marshall. Adams himself, who referred to them as X, Y, and Z. These envoys demanded that America give France a low interest loan, pay up the merchant claims against the French, and give Talleyrand a substantial bribe. Mm -hmm. Shortly after, the French even threatened war if these demands were not met. Ah, the graceful tact of French diplomacy. These vicious bullying attempts were met with careful preparation, the buildup of a navy, and the passing of four laws known as the Alien and Sedition Acts. This authorized the president to arrest and deport aliens during wartime, but the acts also criminalized American citizens who criticized the government. Yeah, this was all stuff that really happened under Adams' administration, and uh, he was heavily criticized for it. It's a big black mark on his career, uh, though I believe some parts of the Alien and Sedition Acts are still on the books. Adams signed off on these laws, but Hamilton's fingerprints were all over them, especially when you consider that they were utilized primarily against the opposition party. Projections in alternate history are often difficult, but here we find ourselves in a position to speculate with a great amount of certainty. Certainty that Hamilton would go apeshit. Never one to turn down an insult, Alexander would issue a formal declaration of war and mobilize the nation. He can only do that if the Senate passes it, though, but if you have an overwhelming majority of Federalists in the uh, Senate, you can do that. But the Secretary of State can't just declare war. 
Department of the Navy would be established, and the Naval Act of 1797 would be passed, prompting the government to raise the funds for the finalization of the last of its first six frigates. On top of commissioning three more, and the first American ship of the line, the USS Independence. This would be done with the assistance of Britain, who was more than eager to have its old colony as an ally against the French. That's true. Hamilton they had taken would. a standing army from 3,300 trained soldiers to 10,000, and now pushed for that number to be increased to 22,000. Numer Which, just for a little bit of context, a 22,000-man national army... Uh, still not that much. I mean, the, the Americans lost more than that dead in the revolution just from disease. Uh, the largest army that that Washington ever fielded on a battlefield, I think, is probably at Germantown. Um, Germantown of Brandywine, and, and it, was, it was less than 20,000. Numerous French businesses were to be seized, which would cause several local rebellions similar to the whiskey and fries. All right, so I had to pause and think about it for a minute because I was starting to second-guess myself on what I said previously. It was actually Brandywine uh, was the largest army fielded in a pitched battle by George Washington at any one time, a little less than 15,000. Uh, largest battle overall uh, in terms of troops on the field is probably the Battle of Long Island, but two-thirds of that were British, so the Americans didn't have that many there at that one time. Not a bad combination. Resistance, though, would be futile, not only because of the powerful army and alien and sedition acts, but because of what the French would do next. The revolutionary government wasn't known for their cool heads. It was known for chopping heads, and after French businesses and vessels were attacked by the same nation French bled dry to free, the American diplomats would be seized and guillotined. Really no going back from that. There's a point... And... <clears throat> I think he makes an important point there that in that scenario, maybe that happens. Because uh, when everything was going down with the French Revolution, the Marquis de Lafayette nearly lost his head. His wife's sister, mother, and grandmother were all sent to the guillotine. And it actually took some diplomatic work on the part of the United States to make sure it didn't happen to Lafayette. And the reason the French didn't go down that road is because they didn't want to anger the Americans. So if you're not worried about angering the Americans, different story altogether. Point in time when American volunteers were ready to aid Genet or even invade Spanish Florida, led by William Tate. Now the gloves were off. And while the South hated the situation they were in, this was an assault on all Americans. The fact that Pinckney was from South Carolina only made things worse. No doubt Hamilton would write an essay distributed across the fledgling nation, fanning the flames of war. But rhetoric... Understand that going all the way back to Hamilton's youth, writing was how he got ahead. Right, he, The thing that puts him on the map is as a teenager, this hurricane comes through his home where he's living, uh, and, he, and he writes an essay about what happened and it gets published in newspapers and this kid's like a minor celebrity and he uses that celebrity and the fact that he's also been running this shipping company effectively at like 13 14 years old uh, to catapult himself into a situation where they raise money uh, on the island where he grows up to uh, send him <coughs> excuse me send him to uh, America to get an education, maybe become a doctor or something with the idea that he would come back. Well, he never came back to the Caribbean. Uh, but writing is what got him ahead then. Writing gets him on the map when he comes to America and he's uh, kind of writing these essays in newspapers, things like Farmer Refuted. Uh, he, he serves on Washington's staff where writing is a big part of his job description all the way along. Only get you so far. Fearing British naval dominance, France and Spain had entered into an alliance in 1796, and as a result, war against the French meant war against the Spanish. The good news was that the Spanish were in total disarray. Not only was their army badly equipped and demoralized after losing to the French, but their massive colonial empire was entirely cut off from the mainland. Britain did not take too kindly to Spain changing sides so easily, and had blockaded all of their major ports. Well, remember Spain had fought against the British, they had sided with the Americans in the Revolution, 
uh, Spain is going to lose in, in our real timeline. They lose the Louisiana territory back to the French during the Napoleonic Wars. Suddenly, Spanish Florida was up for grabs and Hamilton would personally lead the army he himself trained in what was to be the most important training exercise. Oh, and by the way, keep in mind that during this whole time, Napoleon was busy with his campaign in Egypt. And Hamilton, if he's, I'm assuming he's still Secretary of State at this time, that might not have kept him from it, because when he was Secretary of the Treasury, he had gone out with Washington at the head of an army to put down the Whiskey Rebellion. Egypt. Even with local support from many American settlers and to cut off Spain, key Floridian fortresses would still pose a challenge for the young army and navy. But by mid-1798, the test was passed, albeit with a considerable amount of dead conscripts as a result of gunfire and especially malaria. Yeah, I was going to say was disease, big factor down there. Crucial. So in some ways, Hamilton is taking on the role of a future Andrew Jackson who would come along and fight some of these wars. ...victory, which Hamilton would use to renegotiate the Jay Treaty. American slave owners would be compensated for their losses, and the practice of kidnapping sailors for the British Navy would be outlawed. This gesture of goodwill would go a long way to ensuring the support of the South, which was already close to its breaking point. If we are to follow the timeline correctly, and consider that the only change we made was sinking John Adams, then one thing becomes quickly apparent. The Reynolds pamphlet nuke is about to drop. Hamilton's affair with Maria Reynolds, which lasted for a year between 1791 and 92. Despite having knowledge of this for many years, Jefferson waited until 1797 yep. before he started spreading rumors about his life and accused him of corruption. And of course, Jefferson didn't do this directly. That wasn't how things were done. Even when these guys themselves would write things in newspapers, even the the Federalist Papers were written under pseudonyms. They would often use like Roman names like Publius and Cicero, things like that. Uh, Jefferson used his hatchet men, people like James Callender, to do this stuff for him. To keep things simple, we're going to assume that this happens similarly to this scenario too. While Hamilton is fighting in Florida. Now if this guy, Hamilton, is willing to write a 95-page manifesto about his actions when accused of embezzlement, imagine what he would do if he was at the height of his career and this happened after the passing of the Alien and Sedition Acts. Which right, because historically this happened when Hamilton was back in private practice. He had been out of the government for several years. He still had influence, but the influence was in a very different way. Jefferson saw as a most detestable thing, worthy of the 8th or 9th century. Not only was this criticizing the government, but it was also leaking confidential documents, those outlining his meeting with Monroe in 1792. The response would be swift, passionate, and brutal. The arrest for Thomas Jefferson and James Monroe would be issued, while Hamilton addressed the accusations and admitted his adultery. Considering the White House was still being built and the tactical mind of Jefferson, he would undoubtedly be at Monticello. <laughs> Showing the epic rap battle that Jefferson got destroyed in, by the way. I'll just point that out. Surrounded by his loyal supporters. This would be the match that starts the fire of... All right, so let's review the situation. So I, I, do, I do find myself wondering how easily they could have gotten away with arresting a guy like Thomas Jefferson considering he's still the guy who wrote the Declaration of Independence and he was a Secretary of State uh, and had been Vice President. Now, you could say, well, hey, uh, Aaron Burr was also Vice President and was pursued for treason charges. Yeah, but uh, he didn't have nearly the, the credentials that Thomas Jefferson did. I don't know, but in a different world, maybe. Federalist Senate, powerful and wealthy North, well-trained standing army that just conquered Florida, a minor but entirely Northern Navy, who, as in our timeline, scored some crucial morale-boosting naval victories against mighty France, a strong connection with a British ally which had already accepted the reality of losing an American colony, only to then gain a friend and beneficial trading partner who followed... And was very near to abolishing the slave trade itself. 
followed their lead against France and now Spain. On the other hand, we have an incredibly disgruntled nation, including many in the north due to the heavy taxes and prioritization of federal laws over state ones, an agrarian south with prominent leaders such as Jefferson, Madison, John Marshall, James Monroe, as well as a young Andrew Jackson. While the North did have Britain as an ally, we cannot underestimate the power of France and Spain combined, especially since Napoleon was about to take over in 1799. Another thing to keep in mind... Of course, the, I mean, all, obviously, anytime we're talking about alternate history, it's always open to debate. And so if I'm pushing back and I'm offering devil's advocacy here, I'm not saying he's wrong because there is no wrong. Everybody has their own thing. And if I came up with my own alternate history, he'd probably shoot holes in mine as well. Same thing. Uh, but, of course, the question here is, does Napoleon rise to power in the same way that he does if there's a war with the United States? Because... Uh, if you look at the life of Napoleon, obviously he definitely had the talent and the ability, uh, but he also had a lot of things go exactly his way. He was in the right place at the right time and in the right circumstances uh, for him to rise to power the way he did. And if anything changes with that, maybe he doesn't. Is that for all his brilliance, Hamilton was prone to making some bad judgment calls. He was. And alienating those closest to him. And then... Uh, we have slavery. A 1780 census showed that of the 2,780,000 people living in the colonies, 574,000 of them were black, 80% of which were enslaved. Now let's take a look at that distribution. The lack of preparation, equipment, and the proportions we see here, especially in places like Virginia and South Carolina, really make this a one-sided affair. But no one can deny that this is incredibly fascinating. So let's stick with it. Even without this massive push, Virginia and Kentucky were still flirting with the idea of secession, even in our timeline. Yeah. But as far as where... And a generation later, you'll have New England states flirting with the idea of secession. Uh, I can see a plausible scenario where an American Civil War erupts at earlier times than when it did really in our timeline. And in a scenario where Hamilton ends up with more power than he otherwise really had, certainly possible. Because you're going to heighten that divide. Because what ends up happening is when Hamilton has his scandal and Adams uh, tanks after his uh, term in office, the Federalists are pretty much done as a party. And it's really just Democratic Republicans for a generation or two until the Whigs come about. Uh, so g make a strong Federalist party and now you got more of a divide. Where the line is drawn, Maryland could go one side or the other, becoming the first major battlefield, with Virginia acting as the bulwark against the impending northern offense. Right before he died, George Washington would bear witness to his worst nightmare, yeah. bipartisanship exploding the American experiment. Who would lead the South against Hamilton and Henry Knox? How would Jefferson deal I with- I think he misspoke when he said bipartisanship, because bipartisanship actually means both sides working together. I think what he means is the two-party system blows everything up. The overwhelming naval and officer dominance of the North. How much of the British and Napoleonic attention would be turned to the American frontier? These are all incredible questions, all of which can be answered in a future video. You know Here's the thing, though. This whole thing is about what if Alexander Hamilton was president and he didn't become president in this scenario. I understand that he's arguing that Hamilton's influence could be wielded without him being president, but I just thought that was interesting. You know, if there's enough support from people like you. Special thanks once again to Ground News for... All right, so what do you think about all of that? I think it's a pretty plausible scenario, the way he laid it out. I Obviously, I push back on little things here or there, but those are just personal preferences, and it's not to say he's right or I'm wrong or vice versa. Um, so let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. If you want to really take a deep dive into Hamilton, though, check out the link that I'll put up on the screen, and it's also down in the description. It's back when I still wore glasses, back when I was still in the basement at my other house. When I was first starting out, I had only a couple hundred uh, subscribers, but it was a lot of fun, and it was a real deep dive into all things Hamilton. So uh, check it out if you would. Thanks for watching.